Far from the Madding Crowd, Chapter Three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyke Hines. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy, Chapter Three. A girl on horseback. Conversation. The sluggish day began to break. Even its position terrestrially is one of the elements of a new interest, and for no particular reason save that the incident of the night had occurred there, Oak went again into the plantation. Lingering and musing here, he heard the steps of a horse at the foot of the hill, and soon there appeared in view an auburn pony with a girl on its back, ascending by the path leading past the cattle-shed. She was the young woman of the night before. Gabriel instantly thought of the hat she had mentioned as having lost in the wind. Possibly she had come to look for it. He hastily scanned the ditch, and after walking about ten yards along it, found the hat among the leaves. Gabriel took it in his hand and returned to his hut. Here he ensconced himself, and peeped through the loophole in the direction of the rider's approach. She came up and looked around, then on the other side of the hedge. Gabriel was about to advance and restore the missing article, when an unexpected performance induced him to suspend the action for the present. The path, after passing the cowshed, bisected the plantation. It was not a bridle path, merely a pedestrian's track, and the boughs spread horizontally at a height not greater than seven feet above the ground, which made it impossible to ride erect beneath them. The girl, who wore no riding habit, looked around for a moment as if to assure herself that all humanity was out of view, then dexterously dropped backwards flat upon the pony's back, her head over its tail, her feet against its shoulders, and her eyes to the sky. The rapidity of her glide into this position was that of a kingfisher, its noiselessness that of a hawk. Gabriel's eyes had scarcely been able to follow her. The tall, lank pony seemed used to such doings, and ambled along unconcerned. Thus she passed under the level boughs. The performer seemed quite at home anywhere between a horse's head and its tail, and the necessity for this abnormal attitude having ceased with the passage of the plantation, she began to adopt another, even more obviously convenient than the first. She had no side-saddle, and it was very apparent that a firm seat upon the smooth leather beneath her was unattainable sideways. Springing to her accustomed perpendicular, like a bowed sapling, and satisfying herself that nobody was in sight, she seated herself in the manner demanded by the saddle, though hardly expected of the woman, and trotted off in the direction of Tunnel Mill. Oak was amused, perhaps a little astonished, and, hanging up the hat in his hut, went again among his ewes. An hour passed, the girl returned, properly seated now, with a bag of bran in front of her. On nearing the cattle-shed she was met by a boy bringing a milking-pail, who held the reins of the pony whilst she slid off. The boy led away the horse, leaving the pail with the young woman. Soon soft spurts, alternating with loud spurts, came in regular succession from within the shed, the obvious sounds of a person milking a cow. Gabriel took the lost hat in his hand, and waited beside the path she would follow in leaving the hill. She came the pail in one hand, hanging against her knee. The left arm was extended as a balance, enough of it being shown bare to make Oak wish that the event had happened in the summer, when the whole would have been revealed. There was a bright air and manner about her now, by which she seemed to imply that the desirability of her existence could not be questioned, and this rather saucy assumption failed in being offensive because the beholder felt it to be, upon the whole, true. Like exceptional emphasis in the tone of a genius, that which would have made mediocrity ridiculous was an addition to recognised power. It was with some surprise that she saw Gabriel's face rising like the moon behind the hedge. The adjustment of the farmer's hazy conceptions of her charms to the portrait of herself she now presented him with was less a diminution than a difference. The starting point selected by the judgment was her height. She seemed tall but the pail was a small one and the hedge diminutive. Hence, making allowance for error by comparison with these, she could have been not above the height to be chosen by women as best. All features of consequence were severe and regular. It may have been observed by persons who go about the shires with eyes for beauty, 
that in English woman a classically formed face is seldom found to be united with a figure of the same pattern, the highly finished features being generally too large for the remainder of the frame, that a graceful and proportionate figure of eight heads usually goes off into random facial curves. Without throwing an infian tissue over a milkmaid, let it be said that here criticism checked itself as out of place, and looked at her proportions with a long consciousness of pleasure. From the contours of her figure in its upper part she must have had a beautiful neck and shoulders, but since her infancy nobody had ever seen them. Had she been put into a low dress she would have run and thrust her head into a bush. Yet she was not a shy girl by any means. It was merely her instinct to draw the line dividing the seen from the unseen higher than they do in towns. That the girl's thoughts hovered about her face and form as soon as she caught Oak's eye conning the same page was natural and almost certain. The self-consciousness shown would have been vanity if a little more pronounced, a dignity if a little less. Rays of male vision seem to have a tickling effect upon virgin faces in rural districts. She brushed hers with her hand, as if Gabriel had been irritating its pink surface by actual touch, and the free air of her previous movements was reduced at the same time to a chastened phase of itself. Yet it was the man who blushed, the maid not at all. "'I found a hat,' said Oak. "'It is mine,' she said, and, from a sense of proportion, kept down to a small smile and inclination to laugh distinctly. It flew away last night. "'One o'clock this morning.' "'Well, it was.' She was surprised. "'How, how did you know?' she said. "'I was here.' "'You are Farmer Oak, are you not?' "'That or thereabouts. I am lately come to this place.' "'A large farm.' she inquired, casting her eyes round and swinging back her hair, which was black in the shaded hollows of its mass, but it being now an hour past sunrise, the rays touched its prominent curves with a colour of their own. "'No, not large, about a hundred. In speaking of farms the word acres is omitted by the natives, by analogy to such old expressions as a stag of ten. "'I wanted my hat this morning,' she went on. "'I had to ride to Tunnel Mill.' "'Yes, you had.' "'How do you know?' "'They saw you.' "'Where?' she inquired, a misgiving bringing every muscle of her lineaments and frame to a standstill. "'Here, going through the plantation and all down the hill,' said Farmer Oak, with an aspect excessively knowing with regard to some matter in his mind, as he gazed at a remote point in the direction named, and then turned back to meet his colloquist's eyes. A perception caused him to withdraw his own eyes from hers as suddenly as if he had been caught in a theft. Recollection of the strange antics she had indulged in when passing through the trees was succeeded in the girl by a nettled palpitation, and that by a hot face. It was a time to see a woman redden who was not given to reddening as a rule. Not a point in the milkmaid but was of the deepest rose colour. From the maiden's blush through all varieties of the province down to it the crimson Tuscany, the countenance of Oak's acquaintance quickly graduated, whereupon he, in considerateness, turned away his head. The sympathetic man still looked the other way, and wondered when she would recover coolness sufficient to justify him in facing her again. He heard what seemed to be the flitting of a dead leaf upon the breeze, and looked. She had gone away. With an air between that of tragedy and comedy, Gabriel returned to his work. Five mornings and evenings passed. The young woman came regularly to milk the healthy cow or to attend the sick one, but never allowed her vision to stray in the direction of Oak's person. His want of tact had deeply offended her, not by seeing what he could not help, but by letting her know that he had seen it. For, as without law there is no sin, without eyes there is no indecorum and she appeared to feel that Gabriel's espial had made her an indecorous woman, without her own connivance. It was food for great regret with him. It was also a contretemps which touched into life a latent heat he had experienced in that direction. The acquaintanceship might, however, have ended in a slow forgetting, but for an incident which occurred at the end of the same week. One afternoon it began to freeze and the frost increased with evening, which drew on like a stealthy tightening of bonds. It was a time when in cottages the breath of the sleepers freezes to the sheets, 
when round the drawing-room fire of a thick-walled mansion the sitters' backs are cold, even whilst their faces are all aglow. Many a small bird went to bed supperless that night among the bare boughs. As the milking hour drew near, Oak kept his usual watch upon the cowshed. At last he felt cold, and shaking an extra quantity of bedding around the yearling ewes, he entered the hut and heaped more fuel upon the stove. The wind came in at the bottom of the door, and to prevent it Oak laid a sack there and wheeled the cot round a little more to the south. Then the wind spouted in at a ventilating hole, of which there was one at each side of the hut. Gabriel had always known that when the fire was lighted and the door closed, one of these must be kept open, that chosen always being on the side away from the wind. Closing the slide to windward, he turned to open the other. On second thoughts, the farmer considered that he would first sit down, leaving both closed for a minute or two, till the temperature of the hut was a little raised. He sat down. His head began to ache in an unwanted manner, and, fancying himself weary by reason of the broken rests of the preceding nights, Oak decided to get up, open the slide, and then allow himself to fall asleep. He fell asleep, however, without having performed the necessary preliminary. How long he remained unconscious Gabriel never knew. During the first stages of his return to perception peculiar deeds seemed to be in course of enactment. His dog was howling, his head was aching fearfully, somebody was pulling him about, hands were loosening his neckerchief. On opening his eyes he found that evening had sunk to dusk in a strange manner of unexpectedness. The young girl with the remarkably pleasant lips and white teeth was beside him. More than this, astonishingly more, his head was upon her lap, his face and neck were disagreeably wet, and her fingers were unbuttoning his collar. "'Whatever is the matter?' said Oak vacantly. She seemed to experience mirth, but of too insignificant a kind to start enjoyment. "'Nothing now,' she answered, "'since you were not dead. It is a wonder you were not suffocated in this hut of yours.' "'Ah, the hut,' murmured Gabriel. I gave ten pounds for that hut, but I'll sell it, and sit under thatched turtles as they did in old times, and curl up to sleep in a lock of straw. It played me nearly the same trick the other day. Gabriel, by way of emphasis, brought down his fist upon the floor. It was not exactly the fault of the hut, she observed in a tone which showed her to be that novelty among women, one who finished a thought before beginning the sentence which was to convey it. You should, I think, have considered— and not have been so foolish as to leave the slides closed. "'Yes, I suppose I should,' said Oak absently. He was endeavouring to catch and appreciate the sensation of being thus with her, his head upon her dress, before the event passed on into the heap of bygone things. He wished she knew his impressions, but he would as soon have thought of carrying an odour in a net as of attempting to convey the intangibilities of his feelings in the coarse meshes of language. So he remained silent. She made him sit up, and then Oak began wiping his face and shaking himself like a Samson. "'How can I thank ye?' he said at last, gratefully, some of the natural rusty red having returned to his face. "'Oh, never mind that,' said the girl, smiling, and allowing her smile to hold good for Gabriel's next remark, whatever that might prove to be. "'How did you find me?' I heard your dog howling and scratching at the door of the hut when I came to the milking. It was so lucky Daisy's milking is almost over for the season, and I shall not come here after this week or the next. The dog saw me and jumped over to me and laid hold of my skirt. I came across and looked round the hut, the very first thing, to see if the slides were closed. My uncle has a hut like this one, and I have heard him tell his shepherd not to go to sleep without leaving a slide open. I opened the door, and there you were, like dead. I threw the milk over you, as there was no water, forgetting it was warm and no use. "'I wonder if I should have died,' said Gabriel, in a low voice, which was rather meant to travel back to himself than to her. "'Oh, no,' the girl replied. She seemed to prefer a less tragic probability. To have saved the man from death involved talk that should harmonise with the dignity of such a deed, and she shunned it. "'I believe you saved my life, miss. I, I don't know your name.' I know your aunt's, but not yours. I would just as soon not tell it. Rather not. There is no reason either why I should, as you probably will never have much to do with me. Still, I should like to know. 
You can inquire at my aunt's. She will tell you. My name is Gabriel Oak. And mine isn't. You seem fond of yours in speaking it so decisively, Gabriel Oak. You see, it is the only one I shall ever have, and I must make the most of it. I always think mine sounds odd and disagreeable. I should think you might soon get a new one. Mercy! How many opinions you keep about you concerning other people, Gabriel Oak. Well, miss, excuse the words, I thought you would like them. But I can't match you, I know, in mapping out my mind upon my tongue. I never was very clever in me inside. But I thank you. Come, give me your hand. She hesitated, somewhat disconcerted at Oak's old-fashioned earnest conclusion to a dialogue lightly carried on. "'Very well,' she said, and gave him her hand, compressing her lips to a demure impassivity. He held it but an instant, and, in his fear of being too demonstrative, swerved to the opposite extreme, touching her fingers with the lightness of a small-hearted person. "'I am sorry,' he said the instant after. "'What for?' "'Letting your hand go so quick. "'You may have it again, if you like. "'There it is.' "'She gave him her hand again. "'Oak held it longer this time. "'Indeed, curiously long. "'How soft it is, being winter-time too, "'not chapped or rough or anything,' he said. "'There, that is long enough,' she said, "'though without pulling it away. "'But I suppose you were thinking you would like to kiss it. "'You may, if you want to.' "'I wasn't thinking of any such thing,' said Gabriel simply. "'But I will.' "'That you won't,' she snatched back her hand. Gabriel felt himself guilty of another want of tact. "'Now find out my name,' she said teasingly, and withdrew. End of chapter 3